like this. Now, that sounds ridiculous. Why should nothing weigh something? Nothing is nothing. And the answer is nothing isn't nothing anymore in physics. Because of the laws of quantum mechanics and special relativity, on extremely small scales, nothing is really a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles that are popping in and out of existence in a time scale so short you can't see them. Now again, that sounds like philosophy, like counting the number of angels on the head of a pin, or religion, or something useless. I shouldn't say, Dan Dennett is here, I shouldn't say philosophy is useless, but um, <laughs> anyway, um, he's also a friend. But uh, the point is, it, we can't measure virtual particles directly, but we can measure their effects indirectly. And in fact, they're responsible for the best predictions in physics. Here, by the way, is actually a, 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 an animation that was shown at the Nobel Prize ceremonies about five years ago by a friend of mine who happened to win the Nobel Prize for, for developing the theory that produced this. This is the space inside of a proton, the empty space inside of a proton. Not where the quarks are, but the empty space between the quarks. And this is, not a, this is an animation, but it's an exact animation coming from physical calculations. This is what the space looks like. Now, how do we know that? Well, there are a lot of reasons, but one of the things are, it turns out most of the mass of the proton comes not from the quarks within a proton, but from the empty space between the quarks. These fields popping in and out of existence produce about 90% of the mass of a proton. And since protons and neutrons are the dominant stuff in your body, the empty space is responsible for 90% of your mass. So, these empty space is vital to science and these calculations are vital to understanding not just protons but electrons and atoms and produce the best comparisons the, and I will repeat this, the best comparisons between theory and experiment in all of science to ten decimal places in quantum electrodynamics using these calculations we can get the right answer. It's amazing. So, if that's the case, let's calculate the energy of nothing where there's nothing else. And when we do that we come up with a calculation which is pretty bad. It's the worst prediction in all of physics. We calculate, you can't even see it, I think, there's a one at the end of that. We calculate that the energy of empty space is a gazillion times the energy of everything we see. That, as I say, is the worst prediction in all of physics, which is why we didn't talk about it for a long time. We calculate that empty space should have an energy of 120 orders of magnitude more than galaxies and stars and people and aliens and all the rest. And if that were the case, we just wouldn't be here. So we knew something was wrong with this calculation. It's been around since I was a graduate student. And we, we, we knew what the answer was. Theorists always know the answer. They're just sometimes right. Uh, the, um, we knew the answer was zero. Because it's the only sensible answer. Because, you know, you can't, ca you can't cancel a big number like this. Let's say the energy of empty space was comparable to the energy of everything we see. Well, we'd have to cancel this big number to 120 decimal places and leave a finite answer in the 121st decimal place. No one knows how to do that in science. But zero is a number we can get beautifully in science. We use mathematical symmetries. Things cancel equal and opposite things cancel all the time in science because of symmetries of nature. So we knew the answer. We didn't know what the symmetry was, but we knew the answer was zero. And we could go to bed at night and that was fine. But you know, the neat thing about cosmology is it's really a science. And science is empirical. Knowing the answer means nothing. Testing your knowledge means everything. And so the question is, we should test what the energy of empty space is. And how could we do that? Well, we weigh the universe. How do we do that? We stand on the shoulders of giants. This, this is a picture I took in, in an island off Sweden, which used to be an island, no, an island off Denmark now, which used to be an island off Sweden. It's the island of Ven, I think I said that right. And um, this guy, if you look carefully, he doesn't have the end of his nose. Uh, his name is Tycho Brahe, and he, he, as many of you know, laid the basis for Newton's law of gravity by doing nothing other than spending 20 years on his back, a noble tradition, uh, um, uh, look, in this case, looking up at the sky without a telescope, measuring the positions of the planets around the sun. And then he was a crummy feudal lord, he got kicked off that island, he gave the data, went to Prague, gave the data to a hapless assistant named Johannes Kepler, who... Um, again spent 20 years without a Macintosh trying to interpret the data and, um, and fudged it, we now know, uh, and came up with, of course, Kepler's laws which led to Newtonian gravity. And the point is, we can use gravity to weigh the universe, including the weight of empty space. Now, why do we care? The reason I got into cosmology. 
General relativity tells us that space is curved. And therefore, the universe can be a one of three different geometries, open, closed, or flat. Now, I can't draw pictures of three-dimensional curved universes very well. So here are pictures of two-dimensional curved universes. This is a closed universe, a sphere, a surface of a sphere in two dimensions. But if we had a closed three-dimensional universe, it's very simple. It'd be very similar. If, we, if, if our universe was closed, we would look, if we looked far enough in that direction, we would see the back of our heads. Light would go around the universe. And an open universe would be uh, I infinite in spatial extent, as would a flat universe. And that sounds really nice, but it's irrelevant. The really important thing is, in a universe full of matter, a closed universe will expand and stop and then recollapse in a big bang, in a big crunch, the reverse of the big bang. An open universe will expand forever, and a flat universe will expand and slow down but never quite stop. And that's why we wanted to know which universe we live in. And as I say, that's why I wanted to, to learn about it, because once I knew which universe we lived in, I would know how the universe ended. Okay? And so, weighing the universe tells us what the curvature of the universe is, and that's why we want to weigh it. So here I want to just show you in the next few minutes how, in fact, some of the most remarkable developments in cosmology, and then tell you how they completely changed our picture of the universe so that we understand that the universe we live in is the worst of all possible universes to live in. <laughs> okay, just so you know where we're heading. This is a cluster of galaxies. Each dot in this picture is a galaxy. Again, amazing to think about. Remarkable. Every one of these galaxies contains hundreds of billions, billions of stars and perhaps civilizations, some civilizations that are mired in religious gunk, other civilizations that have moved beyond, but, and other civilizations that are long dead. Because this is, this is about three billion light years away. Three billion years ago is when that picture was taken, basically. Now, clusters of galaxies are the biggest bound objects in the universe, so if we could weigh them, we could weigh all the mass in the universe, and we can weigh them now. We can weigh them by using general relativity. Because in this picture, it's a remarkable phenomenon that Einstein first predicted in 1937, though he said it would never be observed. He underestimated observers. If you look at this picture, you'll see these blue things, these weird blue things. That is a phenomenon that we now understand as gravitational lensing. Einstein told us that a mass will curve space around it. And he realized, therefore, if you had a big enough mass and you have a source of light behind that mass, the light can bend around that object and come back and be magnified, just like my glasses magnify things. Or, like a cut glass goblet, if you look through it, you see many, I'd see many images of this room. Mass can act like a lens and magnify things and split images, and that's precisely what we're seeing. All of these blue things are different images of a single galaxy located about three billion light years behind this cluster. Gravity is magnifying the, the image, distorting it, and bending it. Remarkable. Truly remarkable. But because we understand general relativity, we could work backwards and figure out how much mass must be in that system and where it is in order to produce that image. We can weigh the system using general relativity. And when we do that, here's, here's an inversion by Tony Tyson, who's now up in Davis, these are, this is the system, and the spikes are where, the, well, uh, this is where the mass is in this system. The spikes are where the galaxies are. But you notice most of the mass in this whole system of clusters of galaxies is not where the galaxies are. It's between the galaxies. It's where nothing is shining. About 50 times as much mass in this system, and in all systems we can measure, comes from stuff that doesn't shine. And physicists with their linguistic perspicacity have called it dark matter. And we now understand that 90% of the mass of galaxies and clusters, including our own Milky Way galaxy, is made of stuff that doesn't shine. And that isn't maybe that exciting because there's lots of things that don't shine. You don't shine if I turn the lights out. Well, those of you from Los Alamos might, but the rest of you <laughs> don't. But uh, the, um, so it could be snowballs or planets or boring stuff, but it can't be. Because for reasons I don't have time to explain, we know how many protons and neutrons there are in the universe. We can actually measure that. And there aren't enough to make up all this dark matter. So we are pretty convinced that that dark matter is a new type of elementary particle. Something that doesn't normally exist on Earth. And the great thing about that is that means the dark matter isn't just out there, it's in this room. As you doze off, it's early in the morning during this lecture. It's going right through your body. And that means we can do experiments here on Earth to look for it. Which is remarkable, and in fact, there, I think, I think uh, well, I'll show you an experiment in a second. 
But 